today we will talk a bit about extreme weather. And I will start with a very bold claim, maybe, namely that knowing statistics one day uh, may save your life. Uh, and I would like to start with a little anecdote. So I live pretty far up north until a couple of weeks ago. Um, we still had snow on the ground here. And I decided to take a skiing trip, okay? And the first thing I did was uh, look at the weather forecast. What I saw was this. So a couple of degrees below zero and light snow. And I thought, well, perfect weather. Let's go ahead with the skiing trip. Uh, however, if I had been a bit more careful and I had looked in a bit more detail at the uh, website I was using for the forecasts, I would have noted that actually the forecaster gave some more information. So they said that um, the most likely weather for the day uh, was light snow and a couple of degrees below zero. Uh, but there was also the chance that the weather would actually be uh, above zero and with some light rain. And unfortunately, it turned out that on the day, uh, indeed, this uh, less likely, but in any case possible, uh, weather pattern uh, is what occurred. And so I ended up going for a ski trip and finding above zero temperatures and light rain. And here, really, the key message is that when we have a forecast, we have a probability. You make a weather forecast, it is not a certainty, uh, but it is a statistic. Uh, let me illustrate this in a slightly different way. Imagine that weather is like throwing a loaded die. So usually uh, our die, uh, dies have uh, numbers 1 to 6 on the six faces. Uh, weather is like a loaded die that may have one number that comes up more often than the others. So in this case we have three times, uh, we have four on three of the faces of the die. Uh, and we can imagine that each face of the die corresponds to a different different weather on the day we are forecasting for. So for example, a one would be sunny, a two would be uh, partly cloudy, uh, the four would be kind of light rain, uh, partly sunny, and the six would be heavy rain on the day. And we make our forecast, and if our forecast is perfect, it would tell us that there is one chance in six of sun, one chance in six of partly cloudy, uh, three chances in six or uh, one chance in two of having some light rain and some kind of sunny, sunny spells, and one chance in six of having heavy rain. So again, uh, it doesn't give us a single certain outcome, but it gives us a range of probabilities. And the forecast that you see on the newspapers or on television is simply the most likely of these probabilities. But it doesn't mean that it is going to happen with 100% uh, of chance. So effectively, what you see as a weather forecast is a most likely uh, outcome. But behind it, there is a lot of hidden statistics. Now, this is all uh, well and good, uh, but it can have a lot more serious consequences than simply a skiing trip gone bad. And here I would like to uh, introduce the case of Hurricane Irma. So Hurricane Irma was a, a very strong hurricane that struck Florida a couple of years ago. And uh, the United States has an excellent hurricane forecasting center. And when there is a hurricane that uh, may make landfall, uh, this center puts out a uh, forecast uh, which gets spread to all the relevant government agencies and local governments, and also communicated through news channels uh, and other media to the general public. And so, two days ahead of the hurricane, uh, the National Hurricane Center in the United States put out this forecast. So here you see a map of Florida, and uh, those little black circles are the most likely location of the hurricane in the coming two days. Okay? And then you also see a white area, and that white area is the region where the hurricane may be in the next two days, but is less likely to be there than along those black dots. So the black dots are, if you want, the weather forecast that gets printed on the newspaper, the most likely location. The white area uh, corresponds to those uh, weather conditions that are not impossible, but less likely to happen. And if we look more closely, we notice that uh, the forecast was that within two days' time, the hurricane would pass almost exactly over the city of Miami. 
and Florida. And so what happened? People saw this forecast, saw the little black dot on Miami, and thought, hey, we're going to be in the path of the hurricane. This is not good. And a lot of people decided to voluntarily evacuate for a couple of days. Okay? Uh, and what a lot of them did was actually go to the other side of the uh, Florida Peninsula. Okay? So they were sitting on the east side, and they decided to go over to the west side. Uh, the problem is that if we uh, fast forward one day, uh, the forecast now said that the most likely path of the hurricane would be on the west coast of Florida. And this is actually the path that the hurricane ultimately took. Now, this was still a good forecast in the sense that the actual path of the hurricane was within the white region given two days before. So the hurricane center said, this is the region where the hurricane may pass, and this is kind of the most likely path. Uh, and in reality, the hurricane ended up passing not quite on the most likely path, a couple of hundred kilometers to the west, but anyways within the white region. Uh, so from the point of view of the forecaster, this was quite a good forecast. Uh, the problem was that it was badly communicated. And so the result was that a lot of people left uh, Miami where there weren't any major uh, catastrophes associated with the hurricane, and ended up evacuating to a place which was actually much harder hit than the place they had evacuated from. Uh, so this goes to show that uh, it is important. So this is the type of uh, picture that you could imagine from uh, the locations that the hurricane actually struck and to which people evacuated to. So this goes to show that uh, a good forecast is important to make. It is worth investing the money to have a good forecasting center for extreme weather. Uh, but uh, it also goes to show that a good forecast isn't necessarily a well-used forecast. Um, and indeed, making a good forecast is just as important as communicating it well, and specifically uh, providing the general public and uh, local government agencies uh, with the tools to understand the forecast. And so this just goes to show that, uh, yes, in my case, uh, I had a bad skiing day as a consequence for not looking carefully at the forecast, uh, but in many other cases, uh, not understanding or not looking properly at the forecast can have much, much more serious consequences. Uh, in in the next part of my talk, I would like to kind of broaden a bit this concept about focus, uh, forecasting extreme weather and also consider uh, the impacts of extreme weather. So you can imagine, for example, when a uh, hurricane strikes, uh, it is great to have a good weather forecast, uh, but uh, the hurricane also has a number of major socioeconomic consequences. And so uh, the question and the idea I would like to present to you is, uh, how and uh, to what extent can we imagine uh, going beyond the simple weather forecast and making a, a forecast of uh, a social climatic event, namely the uh, actual extreme weather event and its uh, social and economic consequences. Uh, this may seem like a very uh, abstract, perhaps, idea, so I would like to illustrate it with a very concrete example. Let us imagine an urban flood. Uh, this is just, uh, as I said, uh, an example, but for example, but we could relate it, for example, to uh, some very heavy floods that struck uh, some large urban centers in the southern part of the United States a couple of years ago, for example, Houston. Uh, and on this uh, plot, you see time on the horizontal axis and vulnerability, namely the uh, inability to withstand an adverse environmental event on the vertical axis. And so the higher up along the vertical axis you go, uh, roughly speaking, the worse off you are as a result of the flood. Uh, and you can imagine a first uh, case where uh, there is a heavy flooding in the city, uh, but you are someone who's living on a very high ground, for example, the top of a hill. So the city is flooded, but your home uh, and your belongings are not really affected. Okay? So your vulnerability level kind of stays constant. Uh, we could also imagine a, a second example where actually you are not living on top of a hill, uh, but you are uh, living in an area that gets flooded. 
However, you have a very good home insurance. So initially, you uh, are affected by the event. The vulnerability goes up because your home is flooded. You sustain uh, social and economic damage. Uh, but then your insurance pays back the whole amount. You are able to rebuild, rebuild your home. And so maybe one year after the event or one and a half years after the event, uh, you're back roughly in the same situation where you were before. Okay, And so we can see this as a recovery trajectory from the extreme event. Uh, we can also imagine a third case. Now you are a, a low-income citizen of this city. Uh, you live in a low-lying area. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't afford a very good home insurance. So your home is flooded. You're forced to relocate. Uh, maybe you lose your job because you were working in a, a small shop uh, in the area that was flooded and doesn't reopen. Uh, you get a very small insurance payout. You actually use this payout to cover your rental costs instead of rebuilding your original home. Uh, and you find yourself suddenly without a job, without money to re rebuild your home, and short of money to pay your rent. And so effectively, the extreme event results, this flooding results in a collapse. And so your vulnerability goes up, and you never go back to the level at which you were before the extreme event. Uh, and finally, we can think of a fourth and last uh, scenario, uh, which I call the bounce back. So now let us imagine that uh, your home is flooded. Uh, so you sustain initially uh, some damage and your vulnerability goes up. But you actually own a building company. And so you not only are able to rebuild your home, but you actually make uh, some pretty good deals because every around the city that has a good insurance or the money to do so is rebuilding your homes at the same time. So your company has uh, lots of uh, work to do. And actually, a couple of years after the event, uh, you're probably better off than you were before the event. Uh, and this example just goes to show uh, how much diversity there can be in the response to an extreme event. So we can have an excellent weather forecast of the extreme event, uh, but then given uh, the weather forecast, we can have a wide range of different uh, societal and economic responses. And so uh, one idea that I would like to put forth is that uh, we, we need and can go beyond uh, simple weather forecasts, so forecasts of the physical part of the extreme event, uh, and we can move towards uh, integrated uh, socio-climatic forecasts, where we consider uh, theory of social responses, so what I just showed you now, for example. Uh, we consider uh, future forecasts of extreme events, so the physical forecasts, the, the weather forecasts that I talked about in the beginning. Uh, we can learn from past extreme events at a given location, so for example, past floods in the city we are interested in. Uh, and we can learn also from extreme events at other locations. So for example, uh, if we are interested in floods in a specific city, going back to my previous example in Houston, uh, we could, for example, think of learning from past floods in other cities in the uh, south, uh, southern or southeastern United States. Uh, all this, as I said, to reach the final goal of having a forecast, which is both climatic and socio-economic. So an integrated socio-economic uh, extreme forecast or extreme scenario. On the one hand, the physical event, the flooding or the hurricane, and on the other hand, the uh, impacts and long-term uh, outcomes of this physical event on our society. Uh, and I really think that uh, forecasting uh, extreme events in uh, a broad sense, so going beyond the purely physical aspect of the extreme, uh, will be in the long term key to uh, our sustainable and resilient future, both in the current climate and imagining that uh, we are currently changing our climate and so uh, the weather and climate that we will be facing in the future will necessarily be different from the one that we have experienced uh, so far. And so I would like to go back to uh, the original bold claim I made at the beginning of my presentation, namely that uh, when it comes to understanding uh, and forecasting extreme weather, uh, you should really know your statistics. And knowing your statistics uh, may indeed save your life. 
think again about that high school or that university teacher uh, covering your statistics course, which maybe at the time you thought uh, was the most boring thing ever, uh, and think about him or her with gratitude, because it is really a, a tool that you may, may end up using uh, in real life. 